Well, everyone, I'm very happy to be here today uh, for a conference uh, for this topic, especially, and it's which is on how to manage a crisis. And I think everybody can agree that right now we're uh, in the middle of a crisis and hopefully coming to an end of one. But as the Chinese say, where there is a crisis, there is opportunity. So here we are. Um, our first guest is Amy Price, who is the president of Bentle Green Cor Oak. And we have Richard Stockton. Richard is the chief executive officer and president of Bramer Hotels and Resorts. He was previously with Morgan Stanley uh, for 16 years as the head of real estate banking. Michael Facitelli is the founder of MDF Capital and co-founder and managing partner of Imperial Companies. Uh, Michael was uh, previously the president and CEO of Bornado Realty. And uh, Jonathan Rose, who founded the Jonathan Rose Companies, which is a multidisciplinary real estate development planning and investment firm, which creates real estate and planning models to address challenges of the 21st century. Jonathan, we're gonna have a lot of questions for you. Uh, Jonathan also wrote a great book called The Wealth of Perk City, and what modern science, ancient civilization, and human nature teach us about the future of urban life, um, which sounds like a great read. Um, Amy, I want to start with you. You manage a lot of um, money for a lot of different institutions and a lot of different people. Uh, in the last year, as your investors are coming to you, how are you explaining the situation? How are you telling them to react? And, uh, and are you a therapist right now? Or uh, what, what, what's the situation? Explain to us. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Sorry, my light's a little... Uh, <laughs> lighting seems bad. Um, all right. Good morning. Uh, I Listen, I think there's a couple of themes here. Number one, anytime there's uncertainty, I just think it's important to be transparent. That's a theme. Communicate what you can, including what you don't know. Uh, I'd say if you reflect on the last year, you know, we've gone through a few phases. It was reactive. It was triage, it was trying to get our head around what was happening and why. And I think kind of fourth quarter or so of last year, there was a shift uh, really toward, you know, I guess what I'd call offense or, um, you know, more, more forward looking kind of how, we, how do we as a firm, we as an industry want to come out of this? Uh, where do we have conviction? Where are we going to invest? How will we manage liquidity? Uh, so lots of themes, lots of conversation with our investors, but I guess what I'd say is, you know, it is that shift to a lot of communication and focus around um, conviction, uh, investment strategy going forward, you know, where we're going to invest and why. Um, again, happy to go into all that, but just- And I'm going to ask you guys about that, So, but that's great. But I just wanted to know the key things you were telling your investors as they were coming to you and telling you what we should do right now. Should we pivot? Should we change strategies? Should we just pull back? Well, again, I think it's it depends on the risk profile and it depends on the geography. But overall, I'd say there was a pullback, and now I'd say it's it's there's more of a um, you know invest with conviction. So um, you know what does that mean? It means that we are choosing our spots. We are pretty aggressive in terms of industrial, which is not a surprise, right? Everybody is. Um, development, cold storage more specifically. We are far more cautious on office. We can talk about that. Uh, but we like the demographics. We like the thematics, but we're also choosing markets um, and strategies related to markets. So again, we can talk about that, but- um, Markets have like really shifted. I mean, Jonathan, this is more for you, but the construct of a city was being challenged in the last year. Like people were asking what's gonna to happen to the future of cities. And uh, you know, if, if, there's no, if there's no need for people to go to offices and there's no need for cities to draw talent because talent can be anywhere, what is the need to have a downtown? And you know, obviously a place like New York or you know, San Francisco and places like that would be the first places to be hurt by it because they're so expensive and there's so much, there's so much there. Uh, what's your take on it? Yeah, you're on mute, actually. Yeah, you're right. Um, so um, thank you for the question. Um, what's interesting is that obviously during COVID, we went through a period where a lot of people were able to work remotely. And as we know, essential workers were not able to work. And many major cities saw an emptying out. For example, barely anybody goes to my office, which is right in the heart of New York City. I happen to have been on a really interesting call yesterday with a series of affordable housing leaders 
and the question, what are we all going to do? And the consensus was that we need to, we need to physically go to the office. We may be only, only three days a week instead of five, five days a week and people may be working from home, but the creative juice, the interactions, the training of young people, the carrying on of your culture, all that requires being in place. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, I definitely think there's going to be return to the return to the office and return to the cities. We're also seeing this, by the way, our portfolio is almost entirely affordable housing. Mm-hmm. We have a little bit of market rate development and we are now seeing um, uh, the market rate rentals uh, dramatic increase in the last few weeks in, in action as we think as people are beginning to rethink now, OK, it was nice being away for a year, but I got to get back. The larger concern I have is, so office, uh, my sense is people will need less office space, but on the other hand, we're redesigning, for example, we ourselves are redesigning our office. We've asked, so what is the office of the future? And we've said it needs to be a laboratory. It needs to be a creative space. It needs to be a place. The other thing is it needs to be a place you really want to go to. Um, And it needs to be, we actually said in part, a sanctuary. Uh, This actually takes up more space. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, uh, different companies reconcile their their space needs. Um, but my, uh, so I think people will be back in offices, but my concern for cities, for example, New York City had about 50 million tourist visits a year in 2019. Mm-hmm. And my sense is that the travel is gonna remain lower for quite some time. People are gonna get back to traveling. Mm-hmm. I think people really, Uh, also learn to value their gardens and being home and reading and being with family more, being with multi-generational family more. So I don't know what the number is, but maybe New York stabilizes at 30 or 40 million visitors a year instead of 50 million visitors a year. And that's going to significantly affect retail and Broadway and a lot of elements, other elements. I would still make it the number one most uh, visited city in the world, so which is a great thing still. But, Even at 40 million. Less, my sense is it'll be less, and that's going to affect the economy in lots of ways and real estate in lots of ways. But, uh, you know, it's even if uh, everything goes back to normal and people have to go back to the office and we get that to 80 percent, you still have a 20 percent vacancy where in a city like Manhattan leaves about 100 million square feet uh, vacant. And, you know, as you guys know, a building is an organism. It has to be maintained and sustained because if it's not, it decays and it affects the things around it. Michael, uh, you guys have projects, office projects going up now. Did you guys at any time when this happened, did you think to pivot or change anything about your plans for the projects that you guys have in development right now? Well, pivots, pivots, a nice concept, but it's very difficult to do. If you own a, if you own a hotel, uh, and what do you got to do? Pivot away from it, sell it. If you're in the middle of a development, what do you pivot to? So it's con- it's intellectually nice, but you own these assets. And the worst time generally to sell is and stuff like this. So if you wanted to say, I don't like retail, I now like industrial, like Amy said, that's not so easy to pivot. You know, it's a, you might in the future be able to say, I'm going to weight myself toward that. I'm not going to do that. So fortunately, this thing hit everyone so quickly and by surprise that you had to deal with your existing assets first, your existing, quote, problems first. So, you know, for instance, I'm, I'm a I'm owner of the Milwaukee Bucks, and we we had a, we built an entire city around the Bucks Arena, new arena. It was doing fantastic. On March 11th of last year, it closed. Mm-hmm. There was no game, no arena. It hasn't been one event in the arena for one year. Now there's limited people coming to the arena. All that entertainment retail around it, the, the restaurants, the retail, has been unbelievably challenged, right? Mm-hmm. There was nothing to pivot to. I mean, I wish I could have pivoted. I but wish you, I could have pivoted. You're literally, like at the beginning of the pandemic, you're in a car that's about to go off the ledge. Do you jump out of the car or do you just like stay in the car and say, I'm going to make this work somehow? Because, you know, so I with- think the, car was, the car was already over the ledge by, by the time <laughs> we knew it. So if you jumped, you, you might get it there faster or shorter than the car. But I, I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting like Venado knows, Venado owns a lot of street retail in New York. They own a lot of office building. It's hard for Venado to pivot to say, I don't want retail in New York anymore because it's it's going to be challenged, right? I mean, uh, Richard's business, hotels got murdered during this crisis. So go into it. Hey, what do you do? So I think the concept is, what do you do from here, John? What do you, what's your, your, your thesis from here? And what actions can you take with your existing portfolio to limit the damage? And what can you do in the future to shape your portfolio differently? I would say this. The other thing in my career, 
when things are really down and bad, it's generally the best time to invest. Right. Generally. Doesn't mean if the future, like, you know, RTC days, the 2008 and nine, the, the real inflection points with the capital withdrawals, but generally when you can make outsized returns, takes guts. That's where I think we should spend, you know, what, what will, is it, Amy said, everybody wants industrial right now. So to say you want industrial is nice, but you're going to pay up for that right now. But if you want retail, you can get a lot of that. So right. I'm not saying you should do that. So I think, you know, the, 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 the idea of what, what, what is going forward a great risk return is important. And the last thing I say is it's very tough to make decisions based on where we are today. I think that if you say, well, no one's ever going to go to the office anymore, that's probably not correct. To Jonathan saying, there will be switches to how people use the office, what you have to provide. But I don't think it's going to be no one's going to go. I think people see this and they make their decisions. You can't make that decision in the middle of a crisis. You've got to step back and away from it to make, I think, more intelligent decisions. Well, let's, then let's talk about forward thinking. Richard, uh, what, what is your position right now? Obviously, uh, business travel, which accounts for 70% of all travel, which I understand has come to a halt. So what, what are you guys uh, doing over there at Bramer to uh, address all of this? Yeah, thanks, Samir. You know, our portfolio uh, breaks down into two sub-portfolios. We've got resorts and urban. And so we have 13 luxury properties. Uh, they're actually luxury and upper upscale. Eight of them are resorts and five of them are urban properties. The resorts, we've seen an incredible bounce back in demand and uh, we're achieving an average daily rate equivalent to same time last year at an occupancy of about 60% across those uh, eight assets. Uh, so in some cases, those properties will have a record year this year. They're mm -hmm. achieving you know, all time highs, uh, particularly an average daily rate for, for uh, February across our entire portfolio, I'll get to the urban portfolio in a second, our average daily rate was up 18%. Mm -hmm. So the drive to leisure markets and even the fly to leisure markets, because we have the Ritz-Carlton and St. Thomas mm -hmm. are performing very well. Um, now the urban portfolio, we have the five other properties in Philadelphia and San Francisco and Seattle and Chicago and Washington DC are struggling. Mm -hmm. And you know they're only operating at about 30% occupancy right now at a rate that's about uh, thirty percent down from mm -hmm. what it was. Uh, in some some cases, obviously more. So uh, those properties are being subsidized essentially by our resort properties right now. Uh, I get the question a lot of times. You know, are we seeing green shoots in terms of in terms of corporate transient demand? The answer is not really, not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a there's a, a, a citywide calendar when we can look at our group business that um, is still on the books starting in August of this year. Pretty much everything between now and August has been canceled. We're starting to see some conferences come up, but really not material enough to make a difference. And so we're still on the lookout for that business traveler. I think people do need to, by and large, get back into offices first, and then we'll start, you know, traveling for work. Uh, you know, there's some hopeful signs is that you know I talked to uh, some uh, luxury caterers, and they said they're literally booked through the summer in the Hamptons. So some of the guys who are doing stuff all over the Northeast, they're just camping out in Long Island and they have so much business that, uh, you know, it's incredible. And there's so many brands that are going, you know, following the traffic there and, you know, doing events and shows in the Hamptons because they really believe by the summer, there'll be a major pickup. Amir? Yes. Um, I spoke about the cities, but at some point I'd like to talk about what's going on in affordable housing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Feel free to jump in any time. So as our company primarily builds and buys affordable and mixed income housing, and uh, we've long told our investors that it was a safe haven because our rents are so below market and because there's such a demand for it, there's really an infinite demand that it would be really recession resilient. And that's exactly what happened. Um, the occupancies are as high as they ever were. Uh, our rent collections have been pretty good and the income has been rock solid. Um, because the demand is, is so steady. Even in cities like San Francisco and, and New York, there may be people who've been out migrating, but there's still over demand for affordable housing. Um, so what's happened as a consequence is that those who could pivot recognized that it was a safe haven. And so there's been a tremendous uh, amount of capital flowing in and therefore uh, just like industrial, I would say over some people are beginning to overpay for the asset class. For, for affordable housing. Yes. 
Yeah, okay, well, that's, that, that's a green shoot. That's nice. Yeah, uh, Michael, uh, in terms of office, you guys, uh, the building, the stuff that you guys had started developing uh, were underwritten at a certain uh, price point. How are you guys adjusting those uh, price points now? Well, I, I don't, I think the office market, you, know, you had Veneto signed up one of the largest leases with Facebook right in the middle of this crisis to take the Folly building. So, you know, there are still people who are expanding. I, to Jonathan's point, Facebook's envisioning using that space in a very different way, I think, than they would have two, three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you froze. I would uh, say rents, what you see in the office is people are putting off the same. Um, Michael, you're freezing a little bit. They don't want to make a five or 10 year commitment now because John, Michael, I don't sorry. think they really quite understand what the post pandemic. Can you repeat that? We, we, missed, uh, we missed some of that. You froze. Okay. Okay, we're recording. It's okay. We can go. Okay. We can go back. Hey, Amy, are you, you just heard what Jonathan said. I mean, he's like one of the leaders when it comes to affordable housing and really understanding the systems of cities and uh, you know migrations to cities. Uh, does that sort of uh, give you confidence to tell your um, investors to put money into affordable housing? Did I lose you right back. Okay. I'm sorry, Michael, we skipped over you and went to uh, Amy, but I'm going to come back. I've never, John, never known a pro forma that actually got exactly met. They're projections, right? So right, right now, we were building something a year or two ago. You have to expect lower rents. But again, we don't know what's going to happen a year or two from now. So it's hard to stop mid-development. So I believe that you're going to see office rents under pressure, retail rents are down. Hotels, as Rick said, is a tale of two cities, but well, negative pressure. There's always been negative pressure on those things. Even apartments in New York, Jonathan has a lot of them. You know, it, it hasn't been great. It's been, you, you've been you given more concessions. You, it's just market rate apartments in New York are worse than they were last year, two years ago, for sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, you just have to say, how bad can you, how do you get through that? How do you price it? So, you know, if we're being honest with each other, this thing wasn't favorable to real estate except for very few asset classes, you know, and, and, you know, we have to just deal with that, but you're in the middle of development. I think we feel there'll be demand. There's a flight to new product, but that will be a, probably a lower prices than we thought we originally envisioned the development. What, what, what are the few asset classes that uh, you mentioned that, that are, that did actually well during this time? For, for instance, data centers, cell tower companies, uh, industrial, as Amy pointed out, out fulfillment uh, things, those asset classes, you know, so many online filming, thing, I think those asset classes, you know, uh, in apartments, and I think in general, in most of the country, in affordable housing, held up relatively one high collection, single family homes, and they did really well. But the retail, hotel, and office, which are the largest asset class, came under negative headwinds for sure. Mm -hmm. Amy, I'd like to go back to you and uh, tell you, would you tell your investors to invest in, uh, in uh, multifamily or affordable housing as Jonathan stated that he's doing pretty well right now? Yeah, I mean, short answer is yes, we would invest and we would you know, advocate to our investors the, the rationale to invest in a multifamily. I'd say I would probably, for us, we would define it as a kind of lowercase affordable slash workforce slash secondary cheaper markets. I think the trend is toward, um, or there, you know, I'd say there's more strength right now in the market and more conviction for the underlying fundamentals when you have a relatively, um, you know, lower density or lower price point um, rent and rent to income affordability and in that defined that way is a really key factor. You know, we own uh, high rise urban Sure. multifamily projects in New York and San Francisco that are absolutely, to Michael's point, struggling the most. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to take the longest. But all said, you know, we have a lot of conviction for multifamily as a sector. And again, we like the more, quote, affordable end of that spectrum right now than the higher price point, um, more dense, more urban uh, for, you know, for investment. Right. Can, I, can I just comment? What, one of the things in our career... There's been a migration. Urban, urban generally outperforms suburban in most asset classes. It outperformed it in office by a wide margin. Hotels outperform in, in apartments. You've had a strange phenomenon going on to Richard's point where urban has gotten really hurt and thus suburban uh, less has been 
been better because you can drive here. You can, it just seems like, you know, I own an apartment building in New York and one of the suburbs, you know, one of the suburbs has been better than the one in downtown New York, San Francisco, the hotel outside of San Francisco has done way better. So I think you, you have a, you have something going on that has not been the trend for the last 10, 15 years. Question, will that continue or not? Right. I think it's going to, what we're going to see is that really livable, smaller cities, uh, are going to do well and there'll be right. more of a distribution of the america's economy throughout the nation which is a good thing we're also going to see the suburbs that are connected to cities so for example the suburbs of denver that are on the light rail are going to do really well and the suburbs that have an more of an old downtown a walkable town town a street grid are also going to do better because people you know it's interesting i've watched this for decades now and when these times come you see in small towns, people sitting outdoors in cafes and like walking the streets and so people, um, they're still social animals and they want to be together and they don't want to be isolated. So although we may not all be in the big cities, we want to be in social places. I'll just jump, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Amy. No, I was just going to jump in quickly on that. I mean, I think that's true short term. I'm going to advocate for the bigger cities on a long-term basis. New York, San Francisco, they're going to feel their pain. But if you look around the world, what, what we're talking about, I mean, it's a very U.S.-centric point of view, right? Asia, we're not seeing the same trends, even in Europe. So I do think there's an accelerator of what was already happening, which, which the migration to the, you know, the Southeast, um, Texas, some of those markets. But I think a lot of that's about cost structure of cities. It's about taxes. It's about employment. So I do agree thematically with Jonathan that, you know, we will continue and we're on an accelerated path and that is good, but I don't think it means, you know, the long-term demise of cities like New York or San Francisco. Um, Richard, what, what is the, your current strategy right now in terms of growth or are you guys just trying to maintain at this point? Yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of people ask us if, you know, just kind of echoing some of the other comments, if we've kind of given up on urban in favor of resorts. Uh, the answer to that is absolutely not. Yeah, I think that this is an interesting time to look at uh, opportunities to buy trophy urban properties that you wouldn't otherwise get, right? Where you're competing with very low cost, sovereign wealth fund money from overseas, et cetera. So uh, we, uh, we likewise you know, believe in the future of cities. Um, in terms of our ability to grow now, you know, that's much more of a question about, you know, balance sheet liquidity and, you know, lodging REITs such as Braemar have all been really whacked over the past year where we've uh, used a lot of our excess cash. We've taken on more debt. And so our balance sheet is kind of out of whack. And, you know, we need to go through a period of healing now where we got to uh, generate more liquidity. We have to pay off this excess debt to get on the front foot to acquire. Um, that said, uh, we can acquire with cash or we can acquire, you know, perhaps by merging into an asset through the issuance of uh, shares. And so that's that's one of the things that's kind of keeping us in the market and, and evaluating opportunities. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a very unique circumstance where you've got sellers, you know, willing to uh, take shares as consideration instead of cash, right? And it's, and it's generally uh, where you don't have a major problem with a near-term debt maturity, or you know, some other uh, sort of cash issue. Um, so we're looking at opportunities. I think it'll be a little bit uh, slow going. The reality is transaction volumes in the hotel space are down 80%. So it's mm -hmm. not as if we're missing out on a lot of anything. There was a, uh, an expectation that this would be you know, the buying opportunity of the decade. I'm not sure it is. I mean, there may be some deals that, that shake free, uh, but there's frankly a lot of capital you know, hundreds of billions of capital, but, you know, sitting in funds that, you know, Amy and others manage that are focused on, you know, hotels and, and looking to buy them. And that's going to pr provide some price support. So right. uh, I, I mean, think you know, we'll, see, one, we'll see less transactions. One thing I, appreciate, I, I think what I see you know, in our careers, if what you had is these disconnects, this usually takes some time for price discovery. Now, if the hotel was 100 and you want to suddenly buy it for 50, the seller doesn't want to sell it. 50 and the buyer is not paying 100. So you just know what happens, no transaction volume. That's right. What that's historically, you could, these patents repeat themselves. Then you just have people looking at each other. And what causes the catalyst is we either now know the underwriting or the bank takes it over or they think somebody else could do it. And now you're not buying it from that 
that emotional seller, you're buying it for something you can't do it. So I, I looked at a hotel recently, Richard would appreciate this. And they said things would be back to normal to sell it in 2022. Now, if you wanted to buy the asset on that basis, you could buy it less than you could two years ago, but you're still buying it at a fairly high price per room. My, right, my, my analysis of that situation was about 25%, 30% below that pricing. And, uh, and not, it didn't trade. It wasn't like uh, maybe I was somebody's more aggressive. And that's what happens until there's some catalyst that time goes by. So when, if Richard wanted to buy hotels, he probably couldn't buy that many in the next six months or three months. But maybe a year from now, he could. Yeah, I think that's Sorry, just to underscore uh, that, po Rich, that point. Um, in 1989, we all experienced those who was in the business experienced a big crash. Prices exactly uh, for the reason prices didn't hit the bottom till 1993. Four years later, it took for buyer and seller mindsets to to kind of reach an accommodation. I, mean, I, I agree with that point. I, I think one of the things that we're seeing this time around, and you know, these things are always uh, different, but but still rhyme, is that uh, you know banks don't want to own real estate, and so they're providing uh, forbearance. And we've been through the first round of forbearance last year, which Took, took owners from kind of April to November. And now it's forbearance 2.0. And, you know, how our lenders, you know, still willing to work with borrowers to give them more time, defer interest, et cetera, waive covenants. We're seeing that's still happening for good borrowers. You know, some borrowers, uh, not so fortunate, and, and there will be some foreclosures, but that it's still early days because the banks are so accommodated. None of these banks want to build up an REO department anymore. And they've kind of been there, done that. They learned from the previous crises that that's a very costly undertaking. Uh, and for that reason, there's, there's less, as Michael said, kind of filtering through the banks into the market right now. There's, yeah. also, there's also a lifeline called low interest rates right now. So the carrying cost of this has been a lot lower. And, and you know, they don't, they don't want it. I, we own buildings, but I own a building with restaurants in it. The restaurants have basically been unbelievably hot hit. Uh, they don't want to pay the rent. They don't want to pay the same rent. My alternatives are pretty minimal. What am I going to do? Uh, so well, you work it out. You sort of say pay percentage rent until you get back on. So, you know, nobody wants the problem that we're just That's why I think this will be shallower and the amount of money will make it shallower and longer. So it'll be a shallower dip in pricing and a longer process, I think. Uh, let me ask you, Richard, this is for Richard and Michael. Are there any assets that you guys currently have that you think it's probably worthwhile to think about repurposing them for different use? I'll go first. You know, yeah, this is something that uh, we looked at in the depths of the crisis. When, when the crisis hit, uh, we closed 11 out of our 13 hotels and frankly didn't know when we'd be able to reopen them. Um, that was in uh, a May, uh, end of April, May of last year. We had almost all properties opened again by June. Uh, but during that time, we did an analysis, you know, can you convert a hotel to multifamily? Can you uh, repurpose part of it? Uh, what, what we found in that analysis is uh, conversion really uh, doesn't work from an ROI perspective when you have an asset that is not functionally obsolesce, uh, obsolete, where uh, maybe there's a slight downturn, but you know it will return. Uh, so the frictional cost of, of the construction and the time and the delay didn't make sense for any of our properties. Uh, I think you really need to find a circumstance where that asset no longer makes sense in its current use forever. And, and some of that's happening in New York. You know, New York's got very uh, large structural challenges in terms of cost with, with uh, labor unions, et cetera. And, you know, some of those assets, you know, aren't coming back online and getting converted. I think those are very limited number of circumstances. And, and you know, you asked the question personally for us, none, none of it had applied to us. Mm -hmm. I think it's limited. Uh, I mean, I think it's hard to repurpose. Um, each case has got to be justified. So I haven't been as fortunate as some of the assets are going to hit to be able to just repurpose them, you know, on an economic basis. So, yeah, you kind of wait it out. But I do see people converting hotels to apartments or micro. Or, you know, you, you, there's some obviously more logical things. An empty office building may go to apartments or workforce type housing, you know, so people are thinking creatively, but then it's in the math. I think you got to do the math and see whether it, it makes sense or not. What are some of the really uh, unorthodox uh, repurposing that you guys have heard of or that people have uh, presented to you? 
Well, I, I can think of one off the top of my head. We had a uh, proposal from um, one of these, uh, I don't even know what they're called, virtual um, apartment operators, uh, that, like um, I'll use some names, Sonder, for instance, mm -hmm. where uh, you know they've got an interesting distribution strategy. They um, and, and they would take over and lease part of a hotel and put it on their platform and essentially you know operate it as um, uh, a different type of hotel, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But um, but and they and they're doing that also with you know apartment buildings. And so I think you know, there are some changes in the world of technology that are introducing these new alternative uses uh, that that could work. And I think in certain circumstances it works really well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's yeah. that's probably one of the most interesting ones. One of the I saw is a lot of malls, which is, we haven't talked about the mall space, but retail, uh, a mall was converted. If you look at this mall, it had typically anchors on end, both ends. One of the uh, anchors was converted to a senior housing facility. Mm -hmm. The major part of the mall was converted to a medical, like a medical center uh, attached to a university, so a drive-through and so forth. And the other was affordable housing to Jonathan. So that mall, which had two big anchors, uh, really looks like basically some limited shopping still there, basically a medical center and a kind of associated with senior assisted living and kind of things. And another one I saw was the same thing near a college to student housing. So people are trying to think about, you know, the platforms where they have large scale pieces of land. But some, those are some of the ones I saw I thought were interesting. I saw a guy in Orlando who bought a mall and uh, turned it into a garage, 600,000 yep garage, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, you know, there's a lot of students uh, uh, watching this. And what are some uh, advice that you guys have for them of where they should go? Like, what sort of uh, paths should they take now with everything that's happened and all the changes and the shifts that have happened in real estate and uh, in architecture? What are some of the paths you think they should focus on where they, they could see a lot of growth in, where there's a lot of opportunity? Can I offer two totally different paths? So one, as Mike said, really important point, this all follows math. And I call it like the, the rules of gravity of real estate, that in the end, you, know, you got income expense and debt service and you got to make it all add up. And so I think uh, going to a company, a good stable company where you can learn the rules of math, the room, the project management, learn all the essential things that you need to know to be in real estate makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, it's just the foundation of your career. And there's a completely alternative point of view, which is now is a great time to, you know, buy a couple, uh, you know, like townhouses or something, or a small building in a crappy part of town or less desirable part of town, and and fix it up yourself, you know, with your own labor, and manage it yourself, and kind of do it from the ground up, and get in and be an entrepreneur. Yeah. So two totally different views. Uh, by the way, I've seen great success paths in both of those. You know, so it's. Uh... That's great advice. And uh, Michael, what do you think? Well, I, I did a class at Columbia, uh, one of these virtual things. I said, the first thing is get a job. You know, I had three, I had three boys, two of them got unemployed quickly during this thing. And one of them had just got a job virtually, which I commend them for, because I think it's very difficult to do that with the help of Columbia. So, it, you know, I think, the, I actually think that if you can get a job and I don't know if Amy or others are hiring, it's been pretty, People haven't needed a lot of people right now. So the real estate market, not easy. If you can get a job, I think it's an unbelievably good time to enter the market. Because mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot of interesting things. And historically, when you entered the market to peak, it wasn't good. So if you entered in 1989, it wasn't as good as entering in 1992. You got a lot more. But it was very hard to get a job in 1992 versus 89. So I think you just get in with the best company you can where you're going to learn the most get the most deal flow and exposure. To, again, doing something like Jonathan said requires a little more entrepreneurship. If you need a paycheck, you know, I think getting a job of one, not being too, and getting in with the best company of people you can, with it, the rest of the people agree, but mine tends to be simplistic advice. Do you guys feel in general that uh, salaries have been uh, depressed as a result of the pandemic? Uh, well, I mean, you I I'll jump in on that. I mean, we, um, as a company, uh, cut our salaries during the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. So absolutely, uh, we had uh, raises that um, we had announced and then put on hold. Um, we had people that um, were up for promotion who were told they have to wait. Um, we had bonuses deferred. 
Uh, so, you know, absolutely, uh, that's been an issue. Um, and now that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, we're, we're trying to make amends for, uh, you know, those past transgressions, if you will, right? So we just recently put salaries back up to where they were. Uh, and now we're going to start to look at, you know, raises maybe later in the year. Um, we, we paid off deferred bonuses, right? So it, we're kind of getting back to normal, but there's no doubt that uh, the momentum that had built up over the last uh, eight years uh, definitely stalled, stalled and, and, and declined. Uh, so now we have to get back on track. And do you guys feel like it's tougher to find talent right now or uh, much easier? We're not looking that much for talent right now, but um, I mean, we're, we're kind of, well, we're, we're growing slightly, but we're, we're fairly stable. Um, what's been interesting is, you know, we also manage all our properties. So in the community side, in the field side, there's generally uh, in the industry about a 30% turnover a year nationally. And the turnover has been obviously because of COVID, people are not traveling, people were very grateful for the jobs that they had. And so we've seen the field turnover be, uh, uh, be lower. Um, yeah, I'd say, uh, Amir, it, that the, the answer to that question is very uh, geographically uh, inconsistent, right? I think there are certain areas where there are tons of jobs. Look at Dallas. You know, Dallas is one of the you know, biggest employers uh, in terms of growth perspective in the country right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of jobs in certain metropolitan areas and then very few jobs in others where uh, people haven't gone back to work yet. And, um, and the companies there are, I'd say, a little bit stagnant. So I think the answer is it depends on that one. Right. Uh, but to here in the South, I'm based in Dallas, uh, there's, there's ample uh, opportunity. And then uh, Amy, what about for you guys? Yeah, a few things I'd say, a couple observations. So number one, I'd say within more of the investment management business, mm -hmm. um, 2020 actually wasn't a horrible year um, because there is resiliency of just Mm -hmm. fee streams, et cetera. I think that actually going forward, 21 could be more challenging. And um, so I think there's just a little bit of a delay in running, you know, more private investment management business than the world Rich, Rich lives in, Richard lives in. Um, I would also say in terms of talent, uh, I completely agree. If you're young and you're starting out, it's a great time. Just get a job, try to work with good people, try to learn a lot. Uh, but I would also say that we are hiring um, and I would say it's mixed at a more kind of mid-level or senior level. And I think the reason for that is that there is um, probably a little more resistance to change right now. So if you're at a company and you're like, well, do I really want to make a change now? What could that look like? Uh, I think people are a little more risk averse. Uh, but at the same time, I think that, uh, you know, there's also a lot. I think people are kind of, let's say, a little more freed of past you know, kind of compensation, alignment, et cetera. And so there is a, there is also, you see, you know, more people at a more, again, mid or senior level willing to make changes or, or open to looking at other opportunities um, just given kind of where they, you know, where they, it's, it's, there's a natural reset, I guess, that happens at these points in time, right? So you see but, that trend as well. Right. I mean, this is a question, I guess, for all of you guys. If you have a, a you know, senior level, maybe not senior level, but mid, mid level people, that want to uh, you know, work for your company, Jonathan, for example, or for MDF, Michael, but they wanna live in uh, Tennessee or North Carolina and sort of you know, zoom in for that position. Is that something you guys would consider right now? But like, that's, that's the big talk that people sort of can be anywhere and do their job. Is that somebody that you guys would accept into your company? It's complicated, um, depends on the position. And again, we're a national company. And so actually we do think that having distributed national executive leadership is not a bad thing, but, for, but um, we are requiring that everybody needs to show up at an office when we need to show up at an office. And um, so the, the bottom line is, and, and we have some employees who've been with us for a while, who, for example, the one employee who moved to Maryland because her in-laws and parents could take care of the kids. You know, there's been a whole disruption people have had to go through with school uh, right now and, and taking, so we've been, we've had to accommodate that. And then, but the question is, uh, to what extent can we accommodate that in, in a permanent way? Uh, we're making a few exceptions, but in general, we really think people need to come to an office and be part of a community, part of a culture, and mm -hmm. part of a mentoring. 
of our next generation. Yeah, I, I would say one of the things that's interesting, seeing my youngest son go through the process of getting a job during that, it's different if some of the kids, if you don't have to go into the office for six months, we found people moving out of our buildings and spending time in Bozeman or Boise or Austin or Nashville. But if you have to go in the office two days a week, you're not going to live in Idaho if you're going in New York. Or if you're in Dallas, you're not going to live in New York, right? It's just... It, I think there's going to be a hybrid model, but that will be mean you're going to be in that location or close to that location you could drive. And I, I saw that happening. So my son, for instance, started the job. He's in the office when they can. They had a COVID outbreak, but he's in the office two days a week right now. And he's home, working home. But he's not like skiing. He's working like 10, 12 hours a day from, from a place. So sometimes living with us, sometimes on his own. So I, I personally think that you know, I don't, the model, again, of the future, I don't think people are going to be scattered all over the country when the office in New York. There may be more work from home, but it's going to be a concentric circle. You can get on a bus or on a subway or in a car and be there in an hour, not probably on a plane and be there in four hours with that kind of course. So I do think what I see is people hiring. And I also think they're reluctant to hire and integrate and culturally remotely. In other words, if you were coming with for Amy, some of the people she's got dispersed, you work with for 10 years, you probably, but if you're brand new, you want to never come into the office. How do you integrate that person in and right. teach them and bring them in? It's much more of a challenge. So I think hiring is going to be down until people get, get back to what work for the most part. If that's going to be the case that you feel like people will have to be near uh, downtowns, then yeah. uh, there's great opportunity in areas outside of cities where people can uh, commute to work. Do you think areas like Westchester, for example, in New York and uh, in and other sort of areas like Westchester and other neighborhoods, are those places going to continue to thrive? I mean, uh, upstate Westchester, I believe, uh, grew in price by you know 22 percent in the last year. So is that a trend that's going to continue across the country? Yeah, yeah I particularly mean places with such great, you know, Westchester has such great uh, Metro North trains right to Grand Central. As I mentioned, Denver, where there's the light rail, et cetera, I think you're going to really see that city, urban connect, you know, rural city, suburban connection that's strong is going to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll, a couple of things, right? Number one, if you're only commuting two days a week, you're willing to take a longer commute. So I do right. think it makes that more accessible. I think the other thing we're not talking about, a lot of people, the, the, the people that are commuting into the office and needing to be there, they also, and particularly in our world, right, would spend time on airplanes. It goes back to, you know, why are you, why are you traveling? How do you work? And to the points earlier, I do think that that business travel is going to take longer. I think some of that, it does not get back to where it was. We got on a plane like that. I think we rethink that. So I think some of the way we work, we actually are more focused on, you know, how do we commute to between office and home than get to an airport, which I think is a different dynamic. And then the last thing I'd say, you know, we're really talking about the, um, the parts of our team, I think, in this conversation that, that are more collaborative, need to work together, you know, in the real estate world, right, we're in the markets we're investing in, where do we own assets, but there is a whole other part of the workforce that is more independent, um, that's more task oriented, you know, accounting, IT, et cetera, I think invest, you know, co companies are going to have to focus more on their cost structure. I think I can speak personally. We've had a lot of that, you know, those teams integrated alongside of our investment teams. We're rethinking that, mm -hmm. you know, what's best for those teams, where should they work? And that's where I think you will have more, you know, choose your city, but, you know, other locations that are both lower cost, but also a better lifestyle for that workforce. And I think there will be a dislocation, um, that will have, you know, impacts on demand for types of office in different markets and locations. One thing I'd like to maybe to ask Richard, you see, I found it interesting about the, what will be incremental traffic. I'm on a few boards and those boards used to meet four or five times a year. And, and they always were in person. If you, it was kind of, you shouldn't not go to the board meeting. You have a crisis, yes. And they mostly were, you know, they moved maybe around the city. One was in Dallas. They, for 2022, 21, we can't see how, you know, we're saying maybe we're going to do half the board meetings in person, half virtually. Now we've learned to do virtual. So I don't know whether the long-term impact on Richard's business would be negative because that it was four trips. You stay in hotels, you've got airplane tickets, et cetera. So what I've seen right now, people planning so far in 21, 
21, you're not going to see a lot of people maybe in the second half of the year, but it's going to be very tentative. But 20, even 22, we just went through this. We're, we're, we're saying we're not, we're going to, we're going to cut back the number of in-person meetings to save time. Cause we can do all this administrative stuff on zoom. Now, I never heard of Zoom before this crisis started, to be honest with you. I'm not saying I'm a Zoom expert, I'm kind of proficient. So I, I actually think the John's Point tourism, if suddenly we go from 50 to 30, and suddenly we go from meetings at four times a year to twice a year, that, that will have a profound effect, effect for the economy. It's really sad. I don't know, Richard, if you're seeing that, but we've made a conscious decision on the boards I'm on for 22 to kind of go half and half. Because nobody could figure out the right answer. So we said, let's do half and half in person, half virtual. Yeah, I can tell you what you know. We do for our company is um, we, we do want to see our board members in person uh, four times a year. I don't think that's um, you know too much. I think one of the things you miss from a Zoom call is you know if you know Jonathan, I wanted to pull you aside and kind of you know ask you something personal and have a quick chat and maybe we learn something. And there's we can't do that here, right? right. So we, we only get to talk to everybody and everybody gets to hear what everybody's saying about everybody. And uh, I think there's some value into having those side chats and side interactions and unintended uh, discussions. So, um, yeah, that's why, you know, we, we encourage it four times a year. I know I also agree with what Amy said is, you know, there will be people that kind of rethink. It's like, do I really need to fly to New York for a 30 minute meeting? I can just do a Zoom. Right. So there'll, there'll be some impact. But, um, you know, hopefully as the economy grows in general, um, that will offset the impact of kind of the loss of that you know, face-to-face -face, that's been uh, really driving our business for uh, since the start of time, really in the hotel business. And you guys are- other, I'm sorry, just one other quick anecdote on this yeah. is that, so we're in the business of being in front of our investors, raising capital. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a, an NLP, an investor tell me that she will not take a first introductory meeting in person again. Oh, it's wow. inefficient, inefficient for- them inefficient for the managers, the number of people that would get on planes to go in, sit down in person, have their 30 minutes to, you know, give the pitch. Yeah. Now to the, also the points made also would never go through the entire process fully remote, right? We'll visit a manager in the office. We'll sit down, look them in the eye, all those things, but you don't need to do it on the first meeting. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's the trend, right? There's going to, it's going to meet in the middle, but Right. The first meetings, and, and I totally, the same thing on the boards I'm a part of, I think once a year you have the big dinner, you do the whole shebang two or three times a year, it's governance, it's business, you do it remote. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it allows you to actually get better talent on boards. I mean, part of the reason you kind of think about that commitment you're going to make is like, well, where do I need to be and how many times a year? And I actually think from a company's point of view, again, if I can think globally now about the talent for my board, yeah. I think I actually get to a better place. So I, I really think that's going to be a trend that changes. And I think these will have meaningful impacts about, you know, on how people travel. For us, for example, you know, we, uh, for, for a position for, uh, for an engineer that in New York would have cost us $140,000, we found that person uh, just as qualified in Dallas for 90000 And we miss a few hours, but we, you know, it was a big saving for us. And the more now we don't put a geographic location for our ads and, you know, we, we've widened the pool to the pretty much the whole country. We try to keep it East Coast to some degree for our East Coast coverage, but for the West Coast stuff, you know, you know it's, it's really widened the pool for us as, in terms of the talent pool, which has been incredible. And it's allowing us to grow at a really nice pace. And uh, one last point. I'm sorry. Mike. People in Amy's business that they've never had more success fundraising. And it's been faster, quicker, more efficient. It's particularly true, Amy, for existing investors. I think you say a new a new relationship may be more complicated to develop over Zoom. And I'm not saying, Richard, that I like the Zoom better than in person. No way. I like in person way better. But the trade offs, I think. So I don't know, Amy. I, people have talked about capital raising having a band a year for that, you know, especially in existing investors. So we, yeah. And we did, I mean, we raised over $4 billion last year globally for our right. business in 2020, which is remarkable. Um, and you're right. I mean, part of that is the timing of what you're in the market with, what right. are you offering? You know, I mean, there's a, right. there's a timing to that, but yeah, I think it also is that, um, and, and I think for investors, right, there's a time where they kind of hit the brakes and then they realize they need to get this capital allocated. They need to get capital deployed. And so, yes, when you have an existing relationship, 
a lot easier to you know make that incremental commitment to the manager you already know and you've gone through your diligence and your process with as opposed to you know a new relationship i i, I have a few minutes left i just want to ask you guys is uh, the U.S. still the Swiss bank of uh, world capital? Are you guys still getting a lot of uh, foreign investors? Has the pandemic urged you know, other more vulnerable uh, countries to invest uh, in the United States? I mean, Amy, I'm sure you're seeing that to a degree. And uh, uh, Michael, are you guys seeing that as well? Go ahead, Amy. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we do still see significant capital flows in the U.S. I think that... Um, so I would say capital, you're seeing a lot of foreign capital come to the foreign US. capital in the U.S. I'd say Europe more. I'd say, listen, I, it goes back to probably I'd say the change administration has been important. I think in the prior administration, particularly with China, Asia, you know, there was more resistance. There was a greater question mark. Um, but in terms of kind of being the bank, where do people feel um, comfortable investing, you know, outside of a domestic market, which is always number two? Yeah. Again, I mean, what are your global alternatives, right? And I and I do think that we continue to see significant demand um, from global investors into the U.S. and, and also into Europe. Mm -hmm. I think Europe's probably been a net positive, actually, you know, in terms of future trends, incremental dollars, um, because of some of the dynamics around the U.S. I, I see people thinking they want to do it, allocating it, but not actually doing it yet. So there's a there's a difference in, like, Amy, I like to get into New York at, at, where hotels at cheap prices, but they actually hasn't done it yet. The second thing I think, it, Amy, Jonathan, uh, you know, I really believe in New York long term. You know, I, I came from Providence, Rhode Island. I've been in New York since 1982, but I've never been quite as shaken about New York because of the political and tax situation or is kind of uncertain about it. So I, I think the people who you know, again, you make your outsized returns when you buy when other people are scared or don't want to buy. There's a shortage of capital or there's an inflection point. But this inflection point is a little bit more complicated for me to underwrite because of the political and maybe said early tax. Some of the policies are driving away incremental, very, very important constituents that would fuel that economy. So I think when we do think about and I believe urban will come back and roaring back. But I do think we have this overhang of the political stuff that we never worried about as much, and certainly the tax. I don't know if people, John, do you agree with that or not, but I feel strongly that that's one of the things keeping me on the sideline until I see, like, who's going to be the next mayor of New York and what's it look like? So, first of all, on the foreign investment, we, too, raised uh, investment funds and had a banner year, got oversubscribed this year, nice. which is fantastic. Um, and what we saw in Europe is there's a dramatic increase in uh, impact investing in ESG, all the pension funds required, et cetera. So affordable housing, since we do green affordable housing with social services for the residents, we're right in the bullseye of where impact investing is going. So yes, they want to be in America. They want to be in really stable returns. It's kind of like traditional pension fund thinking. Uh, the, I think the pandemic has said, let's be safe, let's not be extravagant. Um, and they're really, really looking for impact. We, again, we make it, we have an impact offering, so I'm seeing that part of the market, but we saw a dramatic, there was something that happened in the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd and all the income inequality, all the things we saw that there was a significant shift in the investor mindset that said, I want to invest and not only do well as a return, I want to do well for the world. And um, I think that trend is going to continue to deeply affect the investment market for real estate. As for New York City, um, I'm with Mike. I think that um, it has to rationalize. I keep hearing, you know, the Florida pitch, uh, um, yeah. you know, like no, no estate tax, you know, no, no, no state tax. And um, uh, so, um, and in Texas is saying the same thing, that they're really aggressively pitching on that. So I think New York City is, needs to kind of both we'll have to see who the next mayor is. I don't think New York City is down and out. I don't think, I, you know, right. it's going to be around for a long time. But the other thing is we've seen, you know, what Brexit did by decentering the financial center out of London. So it used to be New York and London, Hong Kong, you know, there were uh, Singapore, there are a couple of key centers in the world. Well, Hong Kong is not going to be a key for the global financial center because of China's takeover. It'll be mm -hmm. a different kind of financial center. It's not going to be globally trusted. London's not going to be one. That means the money is going to distribute more broadly and it doesn't have to be in New York. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Uh, well, you know, on that note, I want to thank you guys. And for anybody who's watching this, who is a New York uh, citizen and a resident, it's so important uh, to make sure that you uh, register to vote. Uh, you know, probably most importantly for the primaries, which is June 22nd, that's probably more important. That's going to indicate who's going to be the mayor of New York for the next eight years. So uh, it, it's four years, but, you know, it's, it's generally eight years. So if uh, you care about this city, make sure to register to vote, especially for the primaries on June 22nd, that's key. I wanna thank our uh, panelists. We had a nice uh, full hour. I think we covered a lot. And uh, any final thoughts from anyone? No, I just wanna to say to uh, <clears throat> students out there, look, this is a very interesting time for real estate, which is what makes it such a fascinating industry to be a part of. And I'm, I'm grateful to uh, been able to experience you know, both the ups and the downs. And that's what makes it a really great uh, career going forward. So um, it's fascinating, but it's also fun too. Richard, the next city we're growing into is Dallas. So uh, maybe when I come out there, I'll come see you. Please do. All right, I say stay, stay patient and uh, stay safe, stay patient, <laughs> you know, and be liquid. That's going to be great. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>